Rizniak. I'm the director of the Bits LCT Hub. Every week, members of the LCT community from around the world join us at the Hub where we learn LCT. We read, we discuss, we share our research. The amazing thing about LCT is that you can analyze anything. And we've had great fun selecting our favorite movies and taking one part of LCT and using it to analyze and talk about our favorite movies. So over the next hour, we're gonna show you seven of the movies that we analyzed. We hope you enjoy them as much as what we've enjoyed analyzing them. My name is Adrian Watson. I'll be looking at uh, fairy tales as axiological cosmologies. And for me, Shrek is an explosive constellation. So I'm going to pay, play you a short clip um, of a combination from Snow White and then from Shrek. So for me, Shrek would form a strongly integrated NOAA code constellation with various purposes uh, socially to, to pass on morals and to make sure that young people stayed in order. Roughly the elements that they contain as a genre would be a monster, often an ogre or some other awful creature, generally a terrorizing villain. There would be a group of people who would be victims of multiple forces, often random peasants, generally helpless passives. There's a damsel in distress, often a princess, uh, in any event, the rescued one. There's a rescuer, usually a prince or a nobleman, becomes the lover of the rescued one, the princess, um, and the rescuer is the hero. There's often a lone silent animal who's a companion to the hero, often a horse, in any event, a trusty steed. Usually there are supernatural forces that defy logic or human reason, witches, evil tormenting powers, spirits. And then there's often a quest involving unattainable goals, obstacles, and some daunting challenges. So those are our elements of the, the traditional fairy tale. Um, and when I looked at it, I understood that these meanings are condensed to positively charge stances along the following lines. So they pejoratively reinforce the stranger danger of the other. They emphasize the stereotypical passivity of women as needing an external savior. And all of these go towards obviously social cohesion in a certain kind of, um, from a certain kind of stance standpoint. Fairy tales emphasize the stereotypical valor and strength of men needed by damsels in distress. They emphasize the acceptability of the powerful rescuer to command at will any and all resources, including the, the randomized, sorry, the marginalized others or the random peasants, the helpless passives to help him in his quest. And then it supports the idea of a symbiosis between the strong, quiet animal and the hero. So as a social field of practice, it's, it's really a form of social engineering. It shapes women's and men's behavior to preserve patriarchy. Women are sweet, demure, physically weak. Men are strong, noble, and brave. It maintains the, the hegemony of asymmetrical power relations linked to access to capital. So one could explore that in terms of the noble, the noble heroes and heroines and the helpless passive peasants and often the, the villain as well. It ensures the strange other is kept outside the village gates, which I'm sure that you can appreciate from a, a 2021 perspective was a very strong um, social cohesion and, and social engineering force. And then they maintain, it maintains the magical thinking as causal and therefore not controllable by human reason and therefore not open or subject to challenge. So Shrek comes along and lays some dynamite in the field and 
in so doing, it opens up the space of possibles and, and disrupts and reconfigures them. And I, I posited the term evaporation in sort of opposition to condensation. So cheeky thing there, forgive me. And what a what these what a story like Shrek does, it contests the traditional stance and and in so doing makes a new kind of Noah both possible and acceptable and importantly for women especially and possibly for people who are civil society's ogres legitimate and so a new social field emerges it's it's known as the fractured fairy tale and it functions to oppose and actively deconstruct and untell the western canon in so doing new knowers are legitimated and can become integrated into the field we have new legitimate gazes that become possible. There's a newly structured constellation and a new axiological cosmology that values and valorizes different things, as you'll see from the graphic. So I just wanted to emphasize what's going on here with a quote from Carl from Mason. Meanings may also be added or removed and subject to reevaluation. That's really what's going on in, in, in Shrek. The things are, are being moved around and particularly reevaluated. So that rather than static knowledge structures, an analysis using LCT and the concept of, of axiological cosmologies delineates a universe of movement and the becoming in which the bases of knowledge systems may be analyzed. I've actually added in there, um, and forgive me, contested and changed. Hello, I'm Marcos Medeiros from Brazil. So here is just a synopsis of the, the film. Andrea Sachs, a small town girl fresh out of the college, lands the job a million girls would die for. Hired as the assistant to Miranda Priestley, the high profile, fabulously successful editor of Runaway Magazine, Andrea finds herself in an office that shouts Prada, Armani, Versace, at every turn, a world populated by impossibly thin, heart-wrenchingly stylish women and beautiful men clad in fine ribbed turtlenecks and tight leather pants that show off their lifelong dedication to the gym. So, Andrea does not belong to, to that world. Uh, her clothes are completely out of these fashion words. She, she gives no importance to the clothes she wears, to the shoes she, she chooses. And then she has a lot of failures. I will just put a little movie when we have a, a turning point, when she realizes that she needs to, to belong to that world, to, to, to gain success in, in, this, in this job. And she finds uh, a friend, uh, a colleague uh, in her work that will help her. So he will teach her how to choose her clothes, how to choose her shoes, how to behave in that world. This in, in the film is the turning point when she, she had a fight with her boss and then he became to to be this another person that will fit in this world. Uh, my suggestion is that she will have a, a gaze that will be cultivated uh, by her friend and by other things that I will show you later. Just let's just watch the, the clip. Okay, so I'm screwing it up. Mm. I don't want to. I just wish that I knew what I could do to Nigel? 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 No. I don't know what you expect me to do. There's nothing in this whole closet that'll fit a size six, I can guarantee you. These are all sample sizes, two and four. All right, we'll join this for you. And... A poncho. You'll take what I give you and you'll like it. We're doing this Dolce for you. Hmm. And shoes, Jimmy Choo. Mm. Nolan Wow. 
Nancy Gonzalez, I love that. <laughs> okay, this is a Rodriguez. This we love. Mm -hmm. uh, it might fit. It might. Mm -hmm. Okay, now Chanel. You're in desperate need of Chanel. Darling, shall we? We have to get to the beauty department, and God knows how long that's going to take. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have no idea why Miranda hired her. <laughs> Me neither. The other day we were in the beauty department yeah. and she held up the swimwear eyelash curler and said, what is this? <laughs> I mean, I just knew from the moment I saw her she was going to be a complete and utter disaster. <laughs> Miranda Priestley's office. No, actually, she's not available, but I'll leave word. Okay, thanks, bye. Pat? <clears throat> Are you wearing the, sh the Chanel boots? Yeah, I am. You look good. <sighs> what? So, this is the when she begins to, to be cultivated in a fashion gaze. But uh, this is how does this occurs? Uh, she's so an outsider. She has not a proper gaze. This that I'm calling here a fashion gaze. She asks uh, some help from Nigel, uh, a friend of her that is an expert. He helps her. He chooses her clothes, her shoes, her outfits from a long, long, long time. And then uh, also at the same time, she has an immersion on the field because the, the office where she works is uh, a, an environment of fashion. She is working with fashion magazines with other models and other people that use that clothes, that has this, this gaze uh, to fashion. Her boss is the most expert in the fashion world. So during the time, she is uh, uh, acquiring uh, this uh, fashion gaze. And it's interesting that at another point in the film, this fashion gaze is incorporated. A prolonged time, the transformation occurs. She began to choose properly her clothes. Uh, in, in this scene of the film, Nigel asks her, who has chosen this for you? Because it was not him. Uh, and she says, I did. And so he, he answers, oh, so I did a great work. My job finishes here. So Andrea, with this interaction with significant others, experts, the, the environment, magazines, the other people in this fashion world, she has incorporated a cultivation fashion gaze. I'd like to introduce you to a movie that I chose today, which is E.T. It's quite famous even though it was um it, it wasn't it, it's been a while since it came to the box office it's a 1982 movie and if you're not familiar with this movie it is about an alien who gets lost in the american suburbs and he um makes a bond with a little boy in america and they strike up an emotional and a telepathic bond and Together, they help the alien get home. It's uh, directed by Steven Spielberg, and it was mostly shot at eye level of the children characters in the movie. The scene that I've chosen is the E.T. phone home scene, which has been the, the, the basis of many um, spin-offs, many um, advertisements. And the scene's pivotal because in the movie, it marks the turn of the plot. By this time, the alien has, has landed, he's turned up in someone's house and they've just, he's just become hiding in the closet and he's, um, he's been hidden from the mum. But now, this particular sequence of shots or scenes is showing at how E.T. tries to harness the help of the children. And the children are called Elliot, 
the, the main character, um, his little sister Gertie and the big brother Michael. Now, the reason why I've chosen that is the meaning that the, the meaning that E.T. wants to share is he wants to come home. And it is through a very interesting array of film techniques that build meaning to get the children in the movie to understand where, what E.T. is doing or what the director is doing. So I've, I could see a synergy with this particular sequence of shots with um, semantic density because um, Maiton's, Maiton's work, which is also um, written in his Accessing Discourse course book, is um, semantic density, or SD, refers to the degree of condensation of meaning within practices, whether it's symbols, terms, concepts, phrases, expressions, gestures, and clothing. So I thought that was really interesting so here we see the shot, which is Gertie, E.T. dressed up uh, because Gertie has treated him like a toy. And the, the back to the, ca the character's back is Elliot the boy. Can you say E.T.? E.T. 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 Be good. Be good. I taught him that too. You should give him his dignity. This is the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. Phone. Phone? He said phone? He said phone? Can't you understand English? He said phone. Home. You're right. That's E.T.'s home. simple but if you split it up and I've I've kind of done that through um, a color coding of the characters what you see is some very definite distinctions between the meanings within each scene and so what happens is there's a whole bunch of things that are going on from to establish what the phone what a phone is and the purpose of the phone to naming to the home to ET and I thought that really looked like building knowledge in a in in a way that um, building knowledge so that we all have a shared meaning the audience the children in the story and ET to have the shared meaning so I, I kind of d distinguished it into four different parts but there was four parts to the establishing Bit. The first set of scenes, you can see that there's some nodes happening where there's E.T. is walking towards the phone and Gertie says phone and E.T. repeats it. And then we culminate into one nodal cluster, which is called you want to call somebody. Then again, another scene where we're connecting, um, there's Elliot says, E.T. says Elliot, which surprises Elliot. And Gertie reinforces that concept, that nodal cluster of he can talk now. Another one was um, the, a cut to the technology, which I thought was quite significant. There was only Gertie talking. She There was a close-up shot of this technology that we get to learn about later. But those two images brought up to um, kind of compose the next node which is what does he need that stuff for so we kind of still don't know we're in the dark about it so then the next part is where et and elliot learn each other's names and that becomes a cluster that is called et and i call once all of those separate meanings are established what ends up happening is there is some kind of connection so in um LCT in semantic density, I see a lot of characterizing where meanings are clustered together and they're still not, they're still not making sense. The next set of scenes is uh, when ET is showing a, um, 
ET is showing a new phone. He said phone, but it's not the phone that we saw in the first scene. It's actually added meaning. It's more embedded meaning. It's now he's pointing. You can't really see it, but he's pointing to an image in a comic that is a radar from a space comic. And we can see that those scenes culminate into ET's home and we're starting to embed and compress the meanings is the way I see it. So now we're at the connecting stage. What I see there is there's a there's a lot of communication where there's a lot of repetition and then we get to this part where after a lot of copying and repetition you see ET phone home. The three separate meanings are squished together and now it's become a more dense and more complex meaning. And just for good measure, Gertie says, oh, he wants to call somebody. And now the audience is ready to have a shared meaning, which is I, which is fits into the taxonomic description where we've got the children moving together. They watch ET say, ET phone home and he points again and at the very end ET says come home. Now that looks to me like the um, if I call it semiotic density we've put the nodes together at the bottom part of this Oh, I don't know, it's not really a translation device because it's not complex enough. But the first set of scenes were augmenting where you're establishing meaning, which is I've used, I don't have, I didn't have a drawing tool, so I've borrowed the um, images from Solo Taxonomy to kind of connect with the idea of clusters. Then it's followed by characterizing, and it's not until all of those meanings have been laid out and explicitly, um, explicitly shown, that's when the characters in the story bring them together. I'm Dorian Love, and I'm an IT and English teacher at Rudin School in Johannesburg, South Africa, and I'm going to be looking at a film by Kenneth Branagh, 1995, called In the Bleak Midwinter, black and white movie, which is very, very arty, of course. So, uh, a brief synopsis. Um, the film is about an unemployed actor who directs uh, a, a troupe of equally unemployed and depressed actors in a production of Hamlet during the Panto season. Um, of course, a, a play that nobody really wants to watch, um, to save an old church that nobody really wants to, to save. This production wants to be extremely innovative in the way we communicate. I'm here to play the Queen. Good Hamlet, cast thy knighted colour off and let thine eye look like a friend. Rubbing low calorie mayonnaise into your face. It's hopeless! It is rather fun always sometimes, isn't it? Absolutely hopeless! Hello, kids. Do stop watching Mighty Morphin Power Rangers and come and watch a 400 year old play about a depressed aristocrat. Good Hamlet, cast off thy coloured nighty and let thy eye look like a friend on Denmark. What do you think, darling? Ah, uh, ah. Uh, what do you mean? I'm speechless. What have I done? Would you like a programme? Yes, please. I'm sorry, we don't have any. <laughs> So Midwinter's Tale is the American title for the American release. Now, if we think about the actor's gaze, um, about the late 19th century, early 20th century, there was a shift in some uh -huh. techniques of acting. So you had the formalism of the um, previous century where 
classical actors very much used their voice to convey the rhythm of iambic pentameter in the Shakespearean theatre. Uh, the style was very recitational. Um, gestures were hyperbolic and movement was done for um, psychological effect, very much relying on the technique of the actor to convey the emotions of the play and to uncover the text, the rhythms of the text. <coughs> and you had a shift towards naturalism. For example, Stanislavski's uh, book, An Actor Prepares, uh, introduced the method and actors then produced the, the, the rhythm of the natural spoken voice. Uh, movement was realistic and the emotional range was, was more normal. And it relied, on, re relied really on realizing the inner motivations of the character rather than expressing outward um, hyperbolic movement. Of course, this break was not complete because uh, on the Shakespearean stage, for example, the classical tradition lasted and, and is still to be seen. Uh, and of course, naturalism to be realistic really needs a lot of technique as well. So there's, there's no complete break. But nevertheless, there was this big jump uh, which occurred in, in acting technique. So what I'd like to do is use a, an LCT lens to look at the film to see if we can uncover anything about the actor's gaze. There's always, of course, knowledge and there's always knowing. So what knowledge is, is there? Well, the knowledge really is, is, in, is encased in the techniques of the actor's craft. So having the right skills uh, to be able to hit your mark and say your lines. Um, if you think about it, if you're performing in a film, then hitting your mark means for a close-up that your eyebrow is uh, three feet high. And so the slightest movement is, is going to be really massive on the screen. Whereas if you're playing on the stage of the old Vic and, and uh, uh, shouting up to the gods where the audience is sitting because they can't afford to sit the seats in the stalls, then you can't even see the face of the actor. M huge movements have to be made to convey exactly the same emotion. There's a lot of technique wrapped up in, in, in acting about projection, voice, uh, makeup, movement, timing, all of that. Um, and if you think about it, could an actor walk onto a stage and do the job without any training? Probably not. But Kenneth Branagh makes the case very strongly that what is key in, in acting is the social relations. It is a NOAA code. It's all about making a connection with the audience, how to engage with the, the audience to, to move, to challenge, enlighten, inspire. Uh, make, making that connection with the audience is what really counts. But there are also subjective relations. Uh, is the actor right for the role? Uh, are they the right age, gender, class, physical appearance, for example, to be able to, to play a particular role? Or can anyone play any role? So a role such as third messenger, for example, could probably be played by anyone. But if you're playing uh, a king or if you're playing um, King Lear, for example, it's probably advisable to have some of the, the identity of the, the role that you're taking on. Interactional relations are what is really key here. So if you think about the, the rehearsal process, the text, working through the text, working with the text, working with other actors, uh, taking direction from the director, um, the process of self-discovery that the actor has to go through, having the right interactions to be able to play that role, because even if you are playing someone very like yourself in identity, you won't be playing someone who has had the same life experiences or has experienced the same emotions. And the actor has to find that in the role. And that is the work of the actor. So in this play, Henry Wakefield, who plays King Claudius, uh, is very much a historian of the, the classic Shakespearean theatre. And at one point in the, in the play, he acts as, as Henry Irving would have acted Othello. Um, he, strange hand gestures, uh, uh, strange voices, uh, very hypnotic performance, but nevertheless not of this world. Terry Dubois, who plays uh, Queen Gertrude, 
um, produces strange voices, uh, and this is what the director Joe takes uh, upbraids him for. He says the, the general movements are fine, but the voice is just a little, it's what they all do, darling, all the grand dames, they don't talk like they do in the real world. They put on the old separate gravel, the treasure trill, the emotional break in the middle of a line, the operatic cadenza, I'm not making it up, they do. And Joe says, sure, and sometimes it's very good, and sometimes they're very wrong, and it gives Shakespeare a bad name. Technically, it is brilliant, but you just don't sound like a human being. And we can see here the, the clash, the curd clash uh, between gazes. So on the one hand, there's the trained gaze, which Henry Wakefield and uh, Terry Dubois are very much looking for. Uh, the performance is legitimated by the knowledge of the craft, the technique, the use of voice, the use of gesture. Um, if you have those techniques, you should be able to walk onto the stage and play any role you like, because you, you have the training to be able to do that. On the other hand, we see some different gazes. So Vernon Spatch, who plays Polonius here with a big nose, uh, he says, I get the message, Chief, basically it's LCA, less crap acting. And th there's a lot of reference in the film to bad acting. Uh, the process of audition is supposed to kind of weed that out. So this is someone who failed in the audition because his performance just simply didn't change. Uh, he was, uh, he put on the hunch and uh, now is the winter of our discontent. Uh, and was not able to drop the, the silly voice and the silly uh, gestures to, to find the, the inner meaning of, of the role. So this is someone who could not be directed. Carnforth, Greville Carnforth, who uh, does get a role, is someone who is very limited in their emotional range. So he's someone who has a great difficulty with um, making social connections with other people. He drinks his way through the rehearsal process. And in this particular scene, he's trying to convey the terror of seeing the ghost. Um, and he says, who goes there? You know, very unterrified voice. So the director steps in and says, well, when have you been terrified? Trying to engage him in a, a process of inner discovery as an actor. And he says, well, one time he was visiting his mother for dinner and uh, the car broke down and he had to change the tire and it was touch and go whether he would make it on time. So that was a very terrifying moment. So when he acts this out on the scene, he drops his halberd uh, and pretends to change a, a car tire, completely missing the point. This forms, uh, I think, a blank gaze where the, performer, the performance is not legitimated by particular knowledge or techniques or the cultivated gaze of having gone through uh, the, the process of self-discovery with the text and, and with the play. Um, can anyone play any role? Well, only really if they go through a process of discovery. So the case that Branagh is making is that very much what he wants his actors to do is not be the trained gaze of the, the classical British theatre, but he wants them not to be concerned with the exterior of the part, the walks, the clothes, the accents, etc. What he wants them to do is to concentrate Danislavski style on the motivations, their drives, uh, what motivates them. And if they get to that, then they will be able to play the role. If they can cultivate the gaze of the role that they are playing, then they will do well. And of course, this forms the cultivated gaze. The performance will be legitimated by the process of with rehearsal and self-discovery, finding the truth within the role. And of course, being a movie, it all works out and the actors, even Carnforth, manage to, uh, to convey it all in the end in that miracle where you can move from a totally chaotic and, and disastrous dress rehearsal to a very successful performance. I'm an accounting lecturer and I'm part of the WITS LCT group. Hi, I'm Nicholas West. I'm a, um, a lecturer at WITS uh, University, Electrical Engineering, and of course uh, also part of the uh, WITS LCT group. The movie that we will be discussing is Dead Poet Society. It's a movie from 1989. It's an American teen drama st um, starring Robin Williams, who is playing John Keaton. One hundred years ago, in 1859, 41 boys sat in this room and were asked the same question that now greets you at the start of each semester. 
Gentlemen, what are the four pillars? Tradition, honor, discipline, excellence. Welton Academy for Boys, a breeding ground for the future leaders of America. An institution dedicated to achievement, virtue, and conformity. A school whose rigid standards are upheld by every single teacher, except one. Come on, Mr. Overstreet, you twerp. Mr. Anderson, are you a man or an amoeba? Language was developed for one endeavor, and that is... To communicate. No! To woo women. Mr. Keating. Rumor has it... You did summer school. Yep, chemistry. My father thought I should get ahead. How's your summer, Slick? Keen. <laughs> Makes door closed. Yes, sir. Gentlemen, what are the four pillars? <laughs> Travesty, horror, <laughs> decadence, excrement. <laughs> okay. Here we see that it is a elite boys' school called Walton Academy. It is a school with very strong traditions, principles, and expectations. John Keating is a new English teacher, and he's using different methods um, and is more progressive than what his colleagues are, but he also manages to connect better with the students. And this very specific expectation from um, the boys in terms of from the parents, but also from the school, of what they should do, where they should go, and how they should achieve these goals. They just need to follow the rules and go and follow this path that's been um, laid out for them. Um, Mr. Keating got some strong quotes. One of them is Carpe Diem. Seize the day, boys. Make your lives extraordinary. The other, the power of life goes on and you may contribute a verse. So in this whole way that he's teaching poetry is completely different. There's a few places in the movie where the students are kind of shocked at how um, he's conducting the classes and how he's teaching at a stage. He's also asking them to tear out pages out of the book because he believes it's um, nonsense. Um, so the headmaster is looking at him frowning upon his practices as well as some of his colleagues then. So what I've been seeing in this movie is constellations. So there's the two big ones. There's what you have from what the school, the um, teachers, the parents are saying, and then on the other side, the kid, the students, the boys. So the school name is Welton Academy, yet for the boys, um, it is Halton. The school's four pillars are tradition, honor, discipline, and excellent. The um, boys have changed this to travesty, horror, decadence, and excrement. And then for this, um, in the school, and it's very strongly from um, the parents as well, there's no arguments. You do as you're told. It's this very formal dress code. And it's like the boys are seen as objects that need to be filled with knowledge. They're seen as being too young or inexperienced to make decisions for themselves. And this is causing a struggle for the, um, for the boys because they can't live the lives that they would like to live and they can't follow their dreams. And then come Mr. Keating. So he's an old scholar of Welton and now he's also the new teacher. So he actually understands more of how these boys are feeling. He starts to connect with them and they actually start to go to him for advice and help with their problems. Mr. Keaton in this case is like balancing or an intermediary in this code clash between the school, the teachers, the parents and the boys. Mr. Keaton was then blamed for the fact that the boys started to make their own decisions and started to follow their dreams. And in the end of the movie, he was fired. Um, yet you could still see the support he had from the boys in the movie. I want to just play you uh, the famous um, barbaric uh, Yorp um, scene, uh, which I'm then going to try and, uh, and analyze a bit more detail. Now, who's next? Mr. Anderson, 
So you're sitting there in agony. Come on, Todd, step up. Let's put you out of your misery. I, I didn't do it. I didn't write a poem. Mr. Anderson thinks that everything inside of him is worthless and embarrassing. Isn't that right, Todd? And that's your worst fear. I think you're wrong. I think you have something inside of you that is worth a great deal. I sound my barbaric yawp. The rooftops of the world. W, W, Uncle Walt again. Now, for those of you who don't know, a yelp is a loud cry or yell. Now, Todd, I would like you to give us a demonstration of a barbaric yelp. <laughs> Come on, you can't yelp sitting down. Let's go. Come on, up. Gotta get in yelping stance. Uh, a yelp. No, not just a yelp. A barbaric yelp. Yelp. Come on, louder. Yelp. Oh, that's a mouse. Come on, louder. Yo. Oh, good God, boy, yell like a man! There it is. You see? You have a barbarian in you, after all. Now, you don't get away that easy. Picture of Uncle Walt up there. What does he remind you of? Don't think. Answer. Go on. A, a, a madman. What kind of madman? Well, think about it. Just answer again. A, a crazy madman. Oh, you can do better than that. Free up your mind. Use your imagination. Say the first thing that pops into your head, even if it's total gibberish. Go on. Uh, go on. A, a sweaty tooth madman. Good God, boy. There's a poet in you, after all. There. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. Close them. Now. Describe what you see. Uh, I, I close my eyes. Yes. Uh, and this image floats beside me. A sweaty tooth madman. A sweaty tooth madman with a stare that pounds my brain. Oh, that's excellent. Now give him action. Make him do something. His hands reach out and choke me. That's wonderful. Wonderful. And all the time he's mumbling. What's he mumbling? Uh, mumbling truth. Yeah, yeah. Truth like like a blanket that always leaves your feet cold. <laughs> Forget them, forget them. Stay with the blanket. Tell me about that blanket. You, 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 you push it, stretch it, it'll never be enough. You kick at it, beat it, it'll never cover any of us. From the moment we enter crying to, to the moment we leave dying, it'll just cover your face as you wail and cry and scream. Yeah. Don't you forget this. All practices effectively consist of, of constituents, uh, whether it's ideas, actors, so forth, knowledge, as well uh, that, are, that are effectively arranged in a particular relationships, um, forming aims and purposes. Based on that, we can determine, we can define effectively, effectively uh, positional autonomy, which refers to the strength of boundaries between uh, the constituents from within the practices or from without as well as relational autonomy, which refers to the strength of the boundaries between the relationships uh, among the constituents that, um, again, from within or from out of, of the practice. Essentially, we're looking at what knowledge um, is drawn from where, as well as how we put that um, to a certain purpose. Um, by placing these two relationships, positional and relational, relational autonomy together, we can come up with four um, main codes, um, sovereign, exotic, interjected, and projected. And essentially, uh, we can now uh, look at how we can use this, this uh, autonomy dimension to explore um, this, this scene um, further. For the scene, positional autonomy here, as we said, refers to the strength of the boundaries between the constituents. Here, in this, in this context, is creating a poem the images conjured, the words, the ideas, the actions needed uh, in the context, of course, of the poetry lesson. For in the case of relational autonomy, uh, we talk about how these constituents come together to create the poem or be a poem, poem be a poet again in the context of this of this poetry lesson. So let's look at this. Um, what's very interesting is that um, Mr. Keating starts the lesson um, in uh, solidly in the sovereign code, talks about um, a a poem, a quote for, from um, Walt Whitman, from a poem by Walt, Walt Whitman. I sound a barbaric, barbaric yawp over the roofs of the world. So here we've essentially got 
um, strong, stronger positional autonomy is referring to, um, uh, to um, uh, poetry and of course also strong relational autonomy. It's about the lesson. So it's a poem about um, a quote from a poem about the, the actual poetry lesson. He then moves the student who does who feels that he doesn't he's not able to uh, perform well um, to actually compose a poem. He moves that student to the exotic. He asks him to um, make a yaw, come on, shout, uh, make a sound. An action that is seemingly completely unrelated to, to the lesson. Um, so the student uh, makes the yaw, gets all excited, and then the teacher, Mr. Keaton, effectively points to the picture of Walt Whitman and says, what do you see then? Who is that? A signifying a, move, a movement closer to a, a stronger relational autonomy, which is of course the purpose now of, of, of getting towards the poem, providing a theme for him to start um, exploring. The next move, the, the um, uh, Mr. Keating moves into the interjected code where he starts probing the student based on the portrait um, of, of Walt Whitman. What do you see? Describe the man. Make him do something and allows the student to um, compose the poem and returns the student finally to the sovereign code by reaffirming affirming to him that you have actually now composed something very poetic. Now, don't ever forget that. So again, the, this seems these these autonomy tours going from sovereign, um, exotic, especially back to interjected often and then back to sovereign, uh, seems to be a common theme throughout the movie. And that's what makes um, um, not only, of course, um, the teaching style of, of Keating unconventional, but also very, very useful within the stifling uh, environment um, of, of the school. My name is Naomi. I'm with UCT. The movie I'm looking at is The Shawshank Redemption. It's about Andy Dufresne, um, who is accused of having murdered his wife and her lover. He didn't do it, but he is jailed all the same. He befriends another prisoner called Red. Red says that he is probably the only person who's guilty in that prison because everybody else goes into the prison saying that they are not guilty. But Red says, no, I'm a murderer. I deserve to be here. And Red's dream is to get out of prison to be free. The movie is about redemption. You've got the redemption in the name of the prison itself, the, the Shawshank redemption, but also the theme of being saved that runs through the whole movie. So in the biblical redemption, you've got, first of all, the process of redemption, You've got agents that help along fulfill that redemption. And then you've got the person of the savior himself. When I looked at the movie, it had those constellations. And the central figure in the whole story of redemption then is the savior himself, who is supposed to be pure, um, who comes in to change the life. So when I looked at the film itself, the first part, the process of redemption, the story, uh, at the beginning I said the story is about Andy, but it's really not about Andy. It's about his friend Red because he's the narrator, he's the one narrating the story. Um, he's the one who feels bound. He's the one who says he's not free. When he meets Andy, what he tells him is that there has to be something better than this. So the acknowledgement that he is in need of salvation is there. Andy tries to show him that the salvation he's seeking is really inside him. Lost interest in that dog. Didn't make much sense in here. Here's where it makes the most sense. You need it so you don't forget. Forget? Forget that there are places in the world that aren't made out of stone, that there's a... there's something inside that they can't get to, that they, they can't touch. It's yours. What are you talking about? The one who brought him the news of salvation was Andy, not only with words, but with how he lived his life. 
when he comes in, he changes people's lives. He built a library for, he, he influenced people to build a library for the prisoners. He, he taught the people and freed them, I guess, empowered them through knowledge. He worked as um, an accountant for the, for the prison staff, helped them balance their books and change their, their lives. They became wealthy because of him. And um, there was evil in there as well. The prison warden was evil. Some of the guards were evil. Some of the prisoners would assault Andy. And um, as the film goes along, all these are overcome one by one. And the movie ends when Andy finally manages to escape prison through a hole which he has been digging for the 19 years that he's been in there. His best friend, Red, believed that he would kill himself. But when everyone wakes up in the morning and when they come to check their cells, they find that his cell is empty. He has escaped. He's gone through the hole. He has escaped. But it goes back to that biblical concept of um, expecting to find the dead body of a savior, but the, the savior's body is missing. When he gets out of jail, he escapes with all the proof he needed to incriminate the prison staff about the crime and the corruption that was going on in the prison. And so, in a sense, he's acting as a judge from outside the prison walls, from elsewhere, the same way we accept the biblical Messiah to be judge as well. And then, obviously, he goes to um, a, a paradise on the coast where he prepares room for his friend, expecting that his friend to come join him there. I hope I can make it across the border. I hope to see my friend and shake his hand. I hope the Pacific is as blue as it has been in my dreams. I hope. in the Disney Pixar movie Ratatouille takes place in Gaston's restaurant where the best food in Paris can be found. After Gaston's death, the restaurant is no longer receiving critical acclaim. Remy knows how to fix it, but Remy is a rat and rats are not welcome in the kitchen. I'm going to look at a few of the characters from Ratatouille and see how they legitimate their practice as chefs. I'll use the specialization and autonomy dimensions of LCT. First, I'll consider whether they emphasize epistemic relations, social relations, both or neither, as a basis for their practice. And then I'll show how the movie takes us on an autonomy tour. So let's start with Gusteau himself. He wrote a book called Anyone Can Cook, a title that suggests weaker social relations, that the practice is open to anyone. In the book, he provides detailed recipes and procedures for how to make the dishes that his restaurant is so famous for. He emphasizes epistemic relations as the basis for being a successful cook. His book therefore reveals a knowledge code as the basis for legitimation. However, in his popular TV series, he sets out an axiological constellation with the qualities needed to be a great chef. Hey, that's Gusto. I mean, look. Great cooking is not for the faint of heart. You must be imaginative, strong-hearted. You must try things that may not work. And you must not let anyone define your limits because of where you come from. What I say is true. Anyone can cook, but only the fearless can be great. In different places, we see Gaston emphasizing epistemic relations and in other places, social relations as the basis for success. We see him waving 
between knowledge and NOAA codes. The little chef Remy is different to the other rats in the colony. He has a highly developed sense of taste and smell and he attributes his success in the kitchen to this attribute. Each flavor was totally unique. But combine one flavor with another and something new was created. But we do know that he's also watched Gusto's programs and read his book. He's got the right kind of attribute, but he's also had the right kind of training. He understands which flavors work well together. Watch now as, his, as he uses his exceptional gift and the training he's had when he finds himself in the restaurant and the pots of food don't smell quite right. Linguini has just started to work at the restaurant. He does odd jobs, requiring no specialised knowledge, procedures or disposition. But he is a human being, and he realises that Remy knows how to cook. He and Remy work together, and through their interactions, Linguini starts to learn how to combine flavours. Colette also teaches Linguini how to act as a chef. Keep your station clear! Ugh, your sleeves look like you threw up on them. Keep your hands and arms in, close to the body, like this, see? Always return to this position. Cooks move fast, sharp utensils, hot metal, keep your arms in. You will minimize cuts and burns and keep your sleeves clean. Mark of a chef, messy apron, clean sleeves. I know the Gusto style code. In every dish, Chef Gusto always has something unexpected. I will show you. I memorize all these recipes. Always do something unexpected. No, follow the recipe. But you just said... No, 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 no. It was his job to be unexpected. It is our job to follow, follow the recipe. recipe. Colette emphasizes the epistemic relations, the discursive ones, the routines and the procedures needed to be successful. Her practice seems to be governed by a knowledge code. Get the recipe right. Do the work efficiently. At first, it seems that the social relations of her practice are very weak. However, she points out to Linguini that it's no coincidence that she's the only woman in the kitchen. The rules of the game were written by what she calls stupid old men. This shows that the subjective relations are not as weak as perhaps Gaston suggested. What made Gaston's restaurant distinctive is that it offers dishes made with quality ingredients, carefully prepared food, and the ambiance of a fine dining experience, giving you the best of French cuisine. Skinner, another chef who works at Gaston's, wants to change Gaston's restaurant into a fast food chain. This sets up an autonomy code clash as he takes a trip into the exotic. It's up to Remy, Linguini and Colette to use their different gazes and insights to remain true to the legacy of the store. The challenge they face is to retain the target of best French cuisine, as well as changing the rules of the game to one in which they can all thrive and play to their various strengths. That's all, folks. One thing that really struck us when we were analyzing our movies and presenting them was how much more there was to say and how we could have very easily have worked with other dimensions or other parts of LCT. Well, that's for next time. Mm -hmm.